The $20 million man has been taken into custody south of the border. Rafael Carl Quintero uh, had the largest bounty ever placed on him for a criminal uh, in history. Al Mencho was at $10 million, Al Chapo was at $5 million when he was brought in, and this guy was at $20 million. Uh, so who is he? Well, Carl Quintero is a guy associated with the so-called Guadalajara but more specifically with the uh, uh, of DEA agent Kiki Camarena, of course, um, uh, the show Narcos, uh, season three in Mexico, kind of centered around that. And he was one of the big four, supposedly, uh, running the Guadalajara uh, operation. And in 1985, Camarena was snatched off the streets things happened to him and four guys, uh, uh, Felix Gallardo, who was called the creator of the Guadalajara, Guadalajara, a couple other guys, and this guy Rafael Quintero. So he was put into prison in 1985. He ended up being found guilty. He was sentenced to maybe 45 years in Mexican prison. So he was in prison from 85 to 2013, at which point uh, on a like a legal technicality, he was let out by the Mexican Supreme Court saying he had been missentenced. And so he gets out and he's living in public and he's saying, I'm not going to be involved in a drug trade anymore. You know, I'm just living. But within maybe 18 months or so of him getting out, uh, the U.S. government starts putting pressure on Mexico saying, no, he needs to be back in custody. They reverse the technicality and he goes on the run. Now, uh, El Chapo, once upon a time in his early days, was a Sicario, was a gunman for Rafael Carl Quintero. They both were born along with a lot of the other architects of the whole, whatever you want to refer to the Mexican gangster system as, from the same Save little part of Sinaloa. And uh, El Chapo was one of his Sicarios. So in 2015, when he went back underground, Carl Quintero went first to hide out with some of uh, El Chapo's people. Uh, then the government pressure came on and he went to hide out with some of El Mayo's people. So he goes to hide out with people that once upon a time he either did business with or their uh, proxies, or in the case of El Chapo, they're his children, and the government pressure made him move on at first from his hiding place with uh, Chapo's people, then El Mayo's people. So then uh, in early 2020, he announces his arrival back on the narco scene in the form of corpses in Caborca. Now, Caborca is a small industrial city under 100,000, about 140 miles from the Arizona border in the state of Sonora. And that border point that it's near is Nogales, which is a very important border crossing. And of course, as uh, the sale of crystal and fentanyl has become so important, um, it used to be in Mexico that like the Sierra Madre Mountains and like where Sinaloa is at was important because uh, marijuana, opium, poppy plants are being grown, but now it's all chemical. So, Probably what's important is who controls the port of Guadalajara, more specifically, who has the uh, corrupt officials. So Guadalajara's violence is way up, and so the chemicals can come in there, and then they can go to wherever you can create some space and uh, produce the stuff and put it over the border, like in places like Nogales. And uh, Sonora has seen the largest uptick in violence of any Mexican state. Uh, coincidentally, starting right around the time when uh, uh, Carl Quintero showed back up with his new uh, cartel. And they're um, fighting with the Sicarios. You know, again, when you say they, I mean, it's the foot soldiers. I mean, Quintero was taken into custody down in Sinaloa. El Chapo's sons are probably in Sinaloa. They might be in Europe. Who knows? Uh, but the foot soldiers are fighting it out in Sonora. And it's El Chapo's sons on one side, along possibly with El Mayo, and they're and and Carl Contreras trying to carve out 
his own place. Now, why would a guy who used to be one of the architects of the system who was able to get out early, you know, why didn't they just give him a place in the sun? Well, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, these are people that kill to make themselves more money and what went on a long time ago might not mean much to someone now. And he didn't want to take a subordinate position. He definitely has let that be, be known. Again, like I said, El Chapo was once a Sicario. And so the idea that a guy who was just one of your shooters long ago, that his sons are going to be telling you what to do, probably was not uh, palatable. And there was a lot of violence around him. Now, the Mexican president, Obrador, several years ago, I, I was talking about this in the aftermath of El Chapo's trial, announced that targeting kingpins would no longer be uh, the policy of the Mexican government because they just, no strategy they seemed to use was effective. And then once pandemic hit 2020, I mean, the Mexican homicide rate went up even more like it did uh, in the United States, but much more drastically there. But about three or four days ago, like just a couple of days before um, uh, Carl Cotero got taken into custody, Biden and Oberdor had a meeting. And of course, Oberdor probably was talking about, hey, it's the firearms coming from the American side down to our side that fuels the violence. And Biden probably said, well, you know, announcing that you're not going to take kingpins into custody and Chapel's son was captured and let go of Video Guzman. I did a story on that. Uh, El Mayo Zambada is still free. Uh, apparently, uh, it doesn't seem to be many military actions trying to grab him. El Mencho is free. Uh, some people think he's dead, but he hasn't been taken into custody. So this might signal a move in the other way or like normal in the so-called war on drugs, you do one thing uh, to make media headlines, like we put El Chapo, put El Chapo away and uh, the drug situation in the United States. Frankly, I mean, on the ground, as we all know, from the number of overdose deaths, 108,000 last year, to the stories I do about people in L.A. And there's the Internet's full of the stories all around the country of uh, fentanyl especially and now crystal meth. 20 million, that's a lot of money, and obviously you don't pay taxes on that and I'm sure it was somebody mid-level to hire in the narco game down there because who else would know where he was at supposedly they uh, got some phone numbers and they were able to triangulate on his position and um, so yeah 20 million dollars is being given out and why sell drugs when you can get 20 million to turn somebody in and then move to Spain or something. I mean, because that is the name of the game to get paid. So somebody close to Carol Quintero turned him in. So, and then the other bigger issue is the use of the word, and I think YouTube doesn't like this word, C-A-R-T-E-L. If word first is documented, I mean, it does have a definition as a word. It was, it's used in economics it's one of the things that's illegal in business, legal business. Um, it violates free market principles. So you have different companies conspiring to set prices. So if I'm Ford and you're GM and we meet with Toyota and we say, well, none of us are going to ever sell a car that we profit less than $4,000 or something on and we're going to open our books to each other so we can verify, well, now you're cheating the consumer because we should be competing with each other. And a drug, C-A-R-T-L, is uh, it's often presented on shows like Narcos or even in RICO cases as if it's like the Italian mafia where there's a boss and underbosses and almost never is it really like that. It. It's loose confederations, like the Sinaloa thing is really referred to as the Sinaloa Federation. A federation of allied power centers. And a lot of it is just family relations. Uh, Carl Quintero, you know, people that are related to him and their children and et cetera, they're their own power group and then gunmen they hire and that's often why they can't tell who's at war with who because you may have 50 Sicarios in some area 
who are kind of uh, pretty much just mercenaries. And they got a guy over them, and he may hire himself out to Los Chapitos, El Chapo's sons, and they may go shoot at one group of at, at El Mayo's Sicarios, but then El Chapo's sons and El Mayo get on the phone and oh, and swap it out and figure it out. So now that stops, and that those 50 Sicarios are out of work. So now they eventually go work for the Jalisco New Generation, and etc. Um, and the big famous names we know are the most powerful people, but for example, right back when the Camarena thing happened in 85, I saw a DEA uh, like diagram map. 67 trafficker groups had identified. They were each their own poles of power. That Some had alliances with each other, some were at war with each other, some were near each other and didn't even interact with each other negatively or positively, but yet this idea called the Guadalajara C-A-R-T-E-L uh, was created, propagated um, by journalists writing books. No one in Mexico was using that in the big papers. Uh, that word was first used in a major way in reference to drug groups in 1977 in front of Congress uh, by the DEA as part, you know, it, as it's, uh, you know, the uh, government agencies have to request funding every year. And the mafia, and comparing everything to a mafia Italian La Cosa Nostra structure is the easiest way to explain to people who aren't experts in crime, which is anybody, including a congressman. But it's, it's not really how the way things works. Carl Quintero is just a guy who once upon a time was very powerful in the narco world, was in prison for a long time, he got out. Some of his old friends looked out for him to a degree until they were like, hey, you're making our spot hot, move along. So after so many years of that, he probably realized, well, the only protection I have from going back to prison, where I already did 28 years, is to make myself enough money to be like El Mencho or El Mayo and sit in the mountains and bribe people and have Sicarios protect me from uh, government incursion. And uh, apparently the bounty on him was the biggest, so his time was up. And somebody's getting that $20 million right now. And uh, Mike Levine, a DEA agent I interviewed, if he's in uh, Cold War Heroin Heat a lot, uh, he worked a bunch of heavy undercover cases. I got a story I did called uh, The House of Death about something that went on in Juarez where he, he, he says some things. But I got a lot of footage I haven't used of him. So I was thinking of doing one of my episodes of American Dope, the full-length docs, and calling it Sinaloa to the South Side. But the whole kind of uh, oeuvre of uh, the Mexican to America drug business. And... Uh, he had some interesting things to say about Kiki Camarena. Of course, there's a lot of evidence that a guy named Felix Rodriguez was a CIA operative who definitely was the guy that killed and chopped off the hands of Che Guevara, that he might have been present at Camarena being T-O-R-T-U-R-E-D by the Mexicans because uh, he had a tape recording of Camarena screaming, what's that all about? Also, Levine specifically worked the case, and if you guys are interested, I'll do something on this. He had negotiated as an undercover agent to pay members of the Mexican military. <laughs> I think they were, you know, it was like a million dollars per 5,000 kilos. It was some massive thing. And a bunch of generals and high-ranking federales got huge, lengthy U.S. prison terms and were sitting in U.S. federal prison for about 18 months, but then it all got, it was a technicality and they got all released. So like the biggest case of his career it went all the way up to the equivalent of the Mexican White House, just below the president. And he got generals and the heads of the whole federally, Mexican federal police, put in US federal prison. I think this was like late eighties. And I don't know, less than two years, they were all back out. And that was one of the things that jaded him. And I'll leave you with this. I could talk about this a lot. Uh, 
Levine talks about when he had, he wrote several bestsellers about his time in a DEA, and he went on the Montel Williams show. And there was a DEA agent named Santo Barrio that uh, Levine knew and had worked with a little bit on the Mexican-U.S. border. Who knew Kiki Camarena? I think it was Kiki Camarena and his partner at one point. Santo Barrio, who Levine said he'd never suspected of being corrupt, was taken into custody on the Mexican side of the border for corruption, which Levine found suspicious. It choked to death on a peanut butter sandwich. It was his official cause of death. And Levine was on a Montel Williams show about to talk about his book, The Big White Lie, about his time undercover in Bolivia, which will be in Cocaine Condor, which I keep promising you. Which is very interesting, but I have clips of it. Watch the real Illuminati. I already have that up. But so any, anyways, he's about to go on Montel Williams to talk about the CIA and Bush's role in the cocaine business. And he's in the green room of Montel Williams, and he gets a call, and he wouldn't. He just said it was from one of my superiors in the DEA, former superiors, because he was retired at that point. And mind you, Levine attained some rank before he retired, so his superiors would be people very high up the food chain at the DEA. And he said the guy simply told him, remember a peanut butter sandwich. A threat of, I guess, right? I mean, why does someone higher up in a DEA tell him, remember a peanut butter sandwich, when his deceased friend recently choked to death on a peanut butter sandwich, a DEA agent who may have known too much, or maybe he was just corrupt, like they said. But Rafael Caro Quintero, the criminal that said the highest bounty ever placed on him, the $20 million man, is in custody. So you can rest your head easy at night. All of you drug addicts in your family and tired of the scourge of cheap fentanyl and meth and other things ruining our cities. It's all going to end because the most wanted criminal has been taken into custody. Al Profit, American Dope.